Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, now we'll begin the discussion on ISS post-2015 options. Next slide, please. I wanted to put this up there first just to kind of frame our discussion. This is from the NASA Authorization Act of 2005 and basically says the administrator shall ensure that we have the capability to continue robust uh, uh, utilization of ISS through 2020 and certainly not take any steps to preclude operation uh, past 2015. Next slide, please. Uh, as you heard Sally uh, mention a little bit ago, though, the uh, current plan is to end U.S. participation in ISS in, in the end of 2015. So that's option number one that we've considered, uh, the baseline, if you will. We also considered two other options which continue U.S. participation through at least 2020. Option two is to continue basically at current levels. And option 2A is what we call an enhanced participation, which I'll, I'll get into. Next slide, please. So option one, and uh, U.S. participation in ISS, uh, the baseline option at the end of 2015. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that some of the funds can be shifted to the Constellation program. But as Sally uh, kind of alluded to for shuttle, and certainly true also for station, there are certain costs that you're going to carry over. Okay? And a lot of those fixed costs are, are pretty significant. So um, the actual savings would not be the total amount that you're spending to operate ISS today. Also, decommissioning costs would have to be deducted from the money that you would shift over. And uh, those plans aren't really well defined right now. Next, please. Some disadvantages. Uh, the U.S. would cede leadership position in human spaceflight, and that's a pretty big loss in international prestige. And that would carry over, we believe, not to other areas, not only in space exploration. And this is an important point. If Orion gets delayed, if Orion IOC gets delayed, as uh, Sally's charts indicated it might, might well, uh, U.S. human spaceflight stops. That is, we would be have, carrying out no human spaceflight activities at all during that gap. And uh, so the U.S. would assume a third place position, basically behind Russia and China. Damage to international relations, as Les was just talking about, the uh, international partners all expressed a very strong desire for continued cooperation, uh, not only in ISS, but in other areas as well. And, um, you know, basically wanting that, that high-level commitment from the United States. And we'd also lose that functioning international framework that is working very well right now in the International Space Station program. Uh, we'd lose, uh, we'd have a loss of national and international assets uh, of the, in the station. We'd have a minimal ROI return on investment on that, uh, the investment that we put into creating it. And it would be a disruption in current uh, HSF medical research, some of which may actually have uh, some applications here on the ground. Next, please. Continuing with the potential uh, disadvantages, we'd have uh, uh, a potential loss in this national lab concept because uh, other folks looking to uh, participate in this may be uh, wary about expending much resources and funding to begin work on developing experiments and other applications that uh, may only go f until 2015. There would be an obvious negative impact for uh, COTS providers and additional workforce impacts if the Orion gets delayed to much past the end of 2015. Next, please. Some notes on this option. Uh, the international partners issued a very strong joint statement in support of continuing ISS past 2015 at the heads of agencies meeting last summer. Russia has publicly stated uh, several times that we'll continue ISS operations uh, independently of what uh, the U.S. decides to do. Now, the U.S. position is that, well, technically, you know, that, pr that may not be possible, but uh, having worked with the Russians quite a bit, and, and for folks who have, you know they're pretty clever, and uh, we should not underestimate their ability to, to do something like that. Next, please. More notes. Uh, estimates show that the uh, cost could not be borne by the IPs. Doesn't seem like they could be. They would be able to absorb the uh, uh, the cost. And as Les just said, ITAR is a is a major issue, even in discussing uh, whether or not that could happen. Uh, we also asked for an analysis of well, what, can't we just mothball ISS and uh, kind of save it for another day? Sure, the, the ISS can be operated in automatic mode, but uh, the analysis shows an, an order of magnitude increase in the risk of loss of vehicle. And of course, that means that you're, you could have a, an uncontrolled entry, which has liability and, and image issues. We also asked for a, a look at a minimal operating mode, just basically conducting operations to keep ISS going, but not really doing any utilization. Uh, but the utilization costs are pretty small compared to the ops costs, so there's really not much money being saved. So why are you saving this asset if you don't plan to, to exploit it? 
And uh, furthermore, you'd have to do a full analysis for the deorbit case, and that really ought to begin now pretty soon if we're really going to deorbit at the end of 15. Next, please. Option two, the second one we looked at, is basically continue current levels of participation, U.S. participation, through at least 2020. Advantages, we'd maintain our leadership position in human spaceflight, uh, maintain our international partnership, and uh, there'd be opportunities for innovation in the National Lab concept. You'd be encouraging people to participate in this National Lab. We'd uh, also be encouraging other folks to do new research, and even some commercial companies may express some interest in doing research. And it would also be a good thing for the COTS providers. Next, please. The disadvantage, of course, is it's going to require additional funding, as you uh, saw in the uh, earlier charts. Next, please. Some notes on uh, option two. Um, you know, leadership in space is, is really a high visibility thing, and I think it's easy to underestimate how important that is. Uh, in the operations only case, the, again, the majority of operation, operations costs are fixed costs, and so uh, uh, only some of, that fund, some of that funding would be able to be brought over to the Constellation program. Next slide. Option 2A is what we call the enhanced participation through at least 2020, and that means to expend a little more money and fully utilize the capability of the ISS. And uh, that means that an expanded U.S. leadership position with a clear commitment to full utilization of ISS, it's an opportunity to expand our international partnerships, and as Les was saying, to further align the space program with national objectives. It's an opportunity to build on the ISS partnership for exploration, and for lack of a better term, you know, the, this partnership could be viewed as kind of the training wheels, or the training ground on how we would do an, ex an international exploration effort. It's an opportunity for full realization of the National Lab uh, concept, and you'd get a maximum ROI on your investment. Uh, also, as uh, some of the other committee members talked about today, ISS could be then utilized as a test bed for technologies for exploration programs and other national needs. Next, please. Disadvantages, it's slightly higher cost than option two. Uh, we're still sharpening our pencils to determine what that number might be. Uh, but again, most of the ISS operating costs are fixed, so the additional costs we, we anticipate would not be uh, that big. And of course, uh, transportation is a variable. It, would be, it could be a very significant variable. Next, please. Some notes on option 2A. Uh, if you include new partners, they definitely should be aligned with uh, national interests. Uh, new international partner plans should be integrated. That is all the, uh, you know, you, you ought to think about how you're going to bring uh, new partners in and uh, what order you might bring them in and what interactions, political interactions you might have to deal with. Uh, some, some potential candidate nations are financially pretty healthy, and so it's not unreasonable to think that uh, there could be some cost offsets for the current partners. Next, please. Some more notes. The new partners may offer game-changing opportunities, and one example, uh, China is, is uh, the only the third nation capable of independent human spaceflight. So there could be some very exciting uh, opportunities with some new partners. Next, please. Okay, and I think that's it. And Charlie uh, Cannell is going to kind of summarize for us and then lead a, a discussion.